So good afternoon, everyone. I um, hope you can hear me OK. Um, and it's my first time in Wigan. So it's a very great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I wanted to thank Jude and her team for uh, organizing and inviting me. Um, as you've heard, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes on this topic, why is autism more common in males? Um, uh, so I'm a researcher uh, at the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to present is, uh, is the latest research, trying to understand this question. Um, I was at a meeting fairly recently where it was about autism, and um, the organiser had very cleverly given people a big red sign saying jargon to hold up um, in case they didn't understand anything that the presenters were talking about. We don't have those signs today, but uh, if, I'll try and keep the, uh, the language um, clear. But if there is anything that is, is unclear, please just wave your hand. That's absolutely fine. And then we will have time at the end for comments and questions. So um, this slide has just got a lot of names on, just to uh, remind me to tell you that uh, our research is conducted in teams. Uh, uh, some of the people in the top of that slide are psychologists or people who are involved in brain scanning. Uh, the second group of people are looking at the role of hormones and genes. Um, and at the bottom there, you can see that we're also working with scientists in Denmark, uh, in Copenhagen. And I'll tell you a bit about this rather large study that we're engaged with. It's a collaboration. So, uh, so the topic that I'm addressing is why is there a, what I call a male bias in autism? Um, many of you will know that in um, classic autism, the sex ratio is about four boys for every one girl. Uh, and that's been reported ever since autism has been talked about, since the 1940s. Uh, in Asperger's syndrome, so just that subgroup of people who've got no learning disability and good language, the, the bias is even more noticeable. Some reports suggest it's nine males for every one female. This could, in part, reflect uh, underdiagnosis of females on the spectrum. Um, and Wendy, I think she's here, there she is, has given me um, a paper that she's written on this topic. So I'm looking forward to reading that. Uh, but I'm sure, it's, I think, I'm sure it addresses the issue about the under-recognition of autism in females particularly females who are high-functioning. Um, so there could be all sorts of reasons to do with um, misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. But there's also a good possibility that uh, the nature of autism, some of the causal factors in autism, uh, are in some way linked to the biology uh, of your sex. And so I'm going to be looking at that. Before I get to the biology, I thought I'd uh, introduce a concept that some of you will be familiar with, which first came from the paediatrician Hans Asperger, here he is, um, who raised this idea that maybe autism is just an extreme of some typical male characteristics. So this was an anecdotal comment that he made in one of his, uh, one of his reports. And it wasn't really something that he tested. It was just an observation that maybe something about the psychology of males, if we can generalize, uh, is manifested in an extreme way in people on the autistic spectrum. So to know whether he was right, we need to first of all have a, a, an idea of what are typical sex differences. And then we can look at people with autism and see is there any truth to the idea that people on the spectrum might have an extreme of the typical male mind or brain? So one way to look at sex differences is actually to look at the brain directly. Uh, so this, these are graphs um, showing brain volume when you put people into an MRI scanner and you look at total brain volume. 
And the graph um, on your left, uh, the, the top graph there, males are shown in blue, females are shown in red, and this is total brain volume. Uh, so what you can see is that on average, in the general population, um, the, the male brain is larger than the female brain. Along the horizontal axis is age. So what's also being plotted in this graph is, um, is the difference in volume um, as the person is getting older. So you can see that all ages, from, this is from age 7 through to 17, um, the brain is larger in, in males than females. Um, the other thing that's shown in the graph are those little arrows, and that shows you where each sex reaches their, their maximum, their peak volume. And what you notice is that females reach their peak at an earlier point than males. So the rate of growth of the brain uh, is faster in females. Um, the, the graph at the bottom uh, shows in red people with autism and in blue, the typical brain. And what this is showing is that in at least a subgroup of people on the autistic spectrum, the brain is larger than the typical brain and it's growing faster, because again, we've got age on the horizontal axis, although the units are different. Uh, now we're looking at months rather than years. So one interpretation of this data is that autism may um, involve an extreme of the typical male brain in terms of size of the brain, uh, volume of the brain. Another way to look at the brain uh, is in terms of specific structures or regions in the brain. And this is the amygdala that many of you will have heard of. Uh, some people think of it as the emotion center of the brain. Uh, because it's involved in the experience of emotion, but also in uh, uh, responding to other people's emotions. Uh, and this is a structure that's larger in males than females in the general population, at least in childhood. Uh, and in autism, um, what's been found is that the amygdala is even larger than in typical males. So if you go for a specific structure like this, Again, you see this pattern that I've summarized in the red statement at the bottom, which is that autism is greater than typical males, which in turn is greater than typical females. But saying it, saying it differently, autism might be an extreme of the typical male brain. Other structures in the human brain show sex differences, but they, they show them in the opposite direction to the amygdala, namely that they're larger in females than in males. So um, I've included two examples here. One is the planum temporale, which is a language region of the brain, and that's larger in typical females than typical males on average. Uh, and the other one is the corpus callosum, which, which you can see here, which is the connective tissue between the two hemispheres, which in certain parts of, of that structure is thicker in females than in males. Um, and what you can see at the bottom there is that in people with autism, both of these two structures are smaller than in the general population. So, um, so now things are flipped around, um, but we're still seeing we're still able to draw the same conclusion, which is that people with autism are showing an extreme of the typical um, male pattern of, of development. Uh, in this case, having an even smaller planum temporale and corpus callosum than typical males. So that's to do with brain structure. Another way to look at sex differences is in terms of behavior. And one way that psychologists study sex differences uh, in children is to observe them when they're at play. And they do this by putting toys out on the carpet, filming the children um, to see which toys they spontaneously choose to play with. Um, and what you can see are two graphs from typical children from summarizing really hundreds of studies between the ages of one to five years old. Uh, basically showing that 
more girls than boys um, choose to play with dolls and particularly creating social stories and imagining the thoughts and feelings of these plastic characters. Um, and more boys than girls uh, choose to play with constructional toys like Lego and um, with um, toy vehicles like toy cars. Now these are just differences on average, they don't apply to all boys or all girls. But if we think about um, the toys that children with autism often get obsessed with, um, very often they are um, very systematic toys like Lego, uh, which they'll arrange in very elaborate patterns and get very upset if other people disturb their patterns. But it may be that in the case of uh, children's play, again, what we're seeing is that their behaviour is simply an extreme of the typical male pattern of behaviour. Interestingly, um, researchers have looked at play in another species, uh, a primate species. This is vervet monkeys. Uh, and this was a study done by Melissa Hines, who's at Cambridge, and colleagues, finding that if you put toy cars and toy dolls or dolls out, um, male monkeys spend more time playing with the toy car, and female monkeys spend more time inspecting the, the doll, um, suggesting that whatever the role of human culture in shaping some of these sex differences we see in behaviour in humans, um, these differences might be partly biological if we're seeing them in a species outside of humans. And I'll come back to the biology a bit later. So this is a study um, from the University of San Diego by uh, a researcher called Karen Pierce, who um, presented two different types of stimuli to, to look at, for, for young children to look at, um, human stimuli like uh, this person's face, or geometric designs, as you can see here. And what she found was at the earliest age you could diagnose autism, if a child spent more than 70% of their time looking at the geometric design rather than the human face, the probability that that child had autism was 100%. So this is a very, I think it's a very neat study in um, identifying that uh, that what you look at, what you pay attention to, can give a, a very strong clue as to whether a child might uh, have a diagnosis on the spectrum. But in relation to what we were seeing earlier about the types of, uh, of toys typical children play with, again, this is sort of suggesting that uh, people with autism might just be showing an extreme of the typical male pattern in having a very strong fascination with things and with geometric designs rather than with people. So another way to uh, look at sex differences um, is in terms of what people study and uh, their scores on academic tests. Uh, this graph shows you the results of the SAT maths test um, in the US the entrance exam into university, but it's just the maths component of that test. And it's showing you year by year what the results are for males and females. So there's a lot of data because you can draw on the whole of the US population just in that age group who are entering university. What you can see is that despite fluctuations year by year, um, males score significantly higher than females on this test of mathematical ability. So maybe what we were seeing in the child play data was simply a reflection of patterns of interest that males are, sh are more attracted to very systematic information like Lego. Uh, but it maybe uh, that also has an impact on, uh, on their progress at school and what they become better at um, by the time they take exams. So. Um, we're seeing a very clear pattern of sex differences in mathematics in the general population. I decided to look at the, the data from my own university in Cambridge to see what the sex ratio was, the sex difference was, in terms of um, applicants to study different subjects. 
So these are the STEM subjects, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, and shown in blue are the male applicants, and shown in red are the female applicants. And I think you can see with the naked eye uh, that there are many more males than females that apply for these subjects. Uh, and actually, um, the proportion of males and females that get offered a place to study these subjects is no different to the proportion of each sex that applies. So, um, so this is suggesting that what people choose to study at university, I don't think Cambridge is unique in this way, it's probably true of Edge Hill too, um, that uh, seems to be quite different in, in the two sexes. Interestingly, if you look at different science subjects, medicine, psychology, and veterinary science, now we see more females than males applying for, to study these subjects. So I've called these animate-centered sciences. Uh, they're either people-centered or animal-centered sciences compared to the previous slide, which I called inanimate-centered sciences, where you're studying things or patterns like mathematics rather than people or animals. And I think this data is very important because it's telling us that there isn't a difference in scientific ability between males and females. Uh, you need exactly the same grades to get into medicine, for example, as you do to get into mathematics or computer science. But it's just that males and females who are interested in science are choosing to study different aspects of science and presumably reflecting uh, their patterns of interest. Um, so these are very subtle differences. Uh, when I showed you the SAT math scores um, from the US, the differences between males and females on that test are actually quite small. And those of you who know anything about statistics will recognize in this, in this uh, slide the normal distribution, the bell curve. And when, whenever you have two bell curves like this, um, and if you find a difference between two groups, in the center of the distributions, um, those differences might be quite small. So those two dotted lines may be quite close together. But Steven Pinker um, wrote uh, in one of his books that one of the properties of the normal distribution is that when you get to the extremes, when you, when you go to the point where the magnifying glass is, the differences become magnified. They become much greater. Um, so here we've got the magnifying glass blown up quite large. And if we just imagined for a second that those normal distributions were uh, measures of height, well, um, we know that males and females differ in terms of height on average. Um, but look what happens when you go out to the extremes. The sex ratio at 5 feet 10 is 30 males for every one female. So it's quite a big sex difference. But if you go just two inches taller at six feet, the sex ratio jumps up to 2,000 males for every one female. So differences at the extremes can become very magnified, very, uh, very big, even if the differences in the middle in the, in, uh, of the population might be quite small and subtle and we wouldn't really notice. And this might have some relevance to understanding extremes in, uh, of, of sex ratio in uh, conditions like autism. Back to mathematics, what you can see is that at the 80th percentile on those SAT maths tests, actually there's no difference between males and females. It's uh, the sex ratio is one to one. But at the 90th percentile, it jumps up to 1.5 males for every one female. And by the time you go right to the extreme, at the 99th percentile, it's two males for every one female. So it's illustrating that same property that I just described, that once you go out to the extremes, you might see um, much more dramatic differences between males and females. And down at the bottom here, I've got a picture of the Fields Medal, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize that's given out in mathematics every year. Uh, and since it was introduced um, uh, some 80 years ago, there have been 52 winners of this prize. All of them have been male. Now, this could reflect all sorts of cultural factors, but it might also be telling us something that's relevant about um, the differences between the sexes 
um, that's partly biological. Back to autism, if you look at what subjects people with autism tend to study at university, those that go to university, uh, this recent study suggested that um, people with autism disproportionately choose to study the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering or mathematics. So, um, so they might have a preference for systematic, structured information um, and they might also be showing an extreme of the typical male uh, pattern of interests. So um, another way that we can look at sex differences is in terms of uh, brain activity. Previously I was showing you data from, uh, about brain structure that's acquired through magnetic resonance imaging, brain scanning. But now what we're looking at is what's the pattern of brain activity whilst the person is lying in the scanner and they're asked to do a task. So here we've got a test of so-called empathy where you have to look at photographs of someone else's face and uh, particularly the eye region of the face and um, pick which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Um, what's found is that people with autism find this sort of test quite challenging, um, being able to read facial expressions of emotion. There is a small sex difference in the general population on this test. Women are slightly better than men at uh, picking the correct word to uh, to, that, uh, of, to describe what she might be feeling. In this example, it's dispirited, that she's a bit sad. Some of you may have got that one right. Um, and down below, we can look at the brain activity whilst people are doing that test in the scanner. And what's found is that women show more activity than men uh, in the general population uh, in a, a region of the frontal lobe called the left inferior frontal gyrus and people with autism show even less activity in that same part of the brain when they're doing this task. So it's not just in terms of play and behavior and patterns of interest and brain structure, but maybe also brain function um, that we see autism as an extreme of the typical male brain. This is a test um, which involves understanding a system so this goes back to the other side of, uh, not, not the social side, but the non-social side of abilities. Um, so I think of this as what I call systemizing, but in this case you're trying to do a bit of physics where you have to uh, look at, in this example, the wheel that goes anti-clockwise. And you have to say what will happen to that point P. It's a multiple choice test, and on this one the correct answer is it will move back and forth um, males in the general population tend to score higher on tests like this than females. Uh, what you can see here is that when we gave this test to a group of teenagers with Asperger's syndrome, they actually scored higher than typical teenagers in trying to solve these little physics tasks. So despite their disability when it comes to reading people, they can read these little mechanical problems very quickly and accurately. Um, showing that, or well, reminding us that autism is actually um, a condition that involves a very mixed profile, some areas of talent um, alongside some areas of disability. Um, this is a task you might be able to see at the top there. It's called the embedded figures test, which psychologists have used for over half a century to measure attention to detail. What you have to do is uh, look for that cube as quickly as you can in the colourful design at the top. And uh, males are faster than females on this task. So at the top there you can, you can see the average number of seconds it takes people to find the target shape. So males are taking about 46 seconds, females about 66 seconds on average. In brackets is something called the standard deviation, which is just a measure of the va variability. People with autism are super quick on this task. They're only taking about 32 seconds to find the target shape. And this, I think, fits with a lot of people's experience that people with autism are very quick at spotting the detail, spotting small things, 
uh, which can, in certain environments, be an asset. Um, and we've asked people to do that test whilst they're lying in the scanner. What we find is that there's a sex difference in the general population in terms of brain activity when people are trying to find the target shape as quickly as they can, uh, that women show more activity than men in part of the visual cortex at the back of the brain called the posterior parietal cortex. People with autism show even less activity in that same part of the brain when they're searching for the target shape. So once again, um, we're seeing that people with autism are showing an extreme of the typical pattern of brain activity on this task. Uh, in this case, whilst they're performing the task at a superior level to someone without autism. So here we are looking at babies because um, so far I've shown you a lot of information about sex differences, uh, but you might rightly say that these sex differences might be the result of culture and socialization and learning. But if these sex differences reflect anything about our biology, then we should find them present at birth before there's been much opportunity for learning. So we studied just over 100 babies at the local maternity hospital in Cambridge. Um, and these are typical babies, boys and girls. We asked the mothers for their consent. Uh, maybe Cambridge is uh, unusual, but these mothers were quite happy to uh, take part uh, on this, in this study for their baby to take part on day one of life. So these babies were 24 hours old. And we showed the baby two different types of stimuli, a social stimulus, which was someone's face, and a non-social stimulus, which was a mechanical mobile suspended above the baby. And we simply filmed the baby for how long they looked at each stimulus. And what you can see is that, um, starting on this side, more girls than boys looked longer at the human face. Uh, and on the far side, more boys than girls looked longer at the mechanical mobile. Of course, there were some babies that didn't show a preference for one or the other. They, sh they looked at each kind of stimulus equally long. But we were just coding whether, what percentage of, ba of, each, of, of babies in each sex showed a bias towards either the social or the non-social environment. So we found this sex difference at 24 hours old, which is quite early. Um, we would have liked to test babies as soon as they were born, <laughs> but, uh, but the maternity hospital asked us if we would kindly wait one day, um, which we were quite happy to do, to let the mother and baby settle down a bit before they took part in research. But gi <laughs> given that this is, this is happening very early in, in development, well, I mean, people who believe that it's all about learning and all about the social environment would say there's been a lot of learning in the first 24 hours of your life. But um, equally possible, this is reflecting something about our prenatal biology. So um, what we've gone on to do is to, uh, to look at um, possible biological factors that might be influencing sex differences in the womb to understand um, where the biology of sex differences in the mind comes from and then to test that in, in autism. So we're looking at women who, who are pregnant and uh, we're looking at hormones in the amniotic fluid which surrounds the baby. There, there's the baby in the amniotic sac and as you know, many, not many, but some women during pregnancy choose to have amniocentesis during pregnancy. It's about 6% of women where a needle is introduced into that fluid. Uh, and they're doing this for clinical reasons. Their doctor has recommended it to test if the baby might have Down syndrome or some other condition. So they're looking for chromosomal abnormalities. So we've been asking those women who are having the test anyway if they'd be happy to take part in research and for us to measure the testosterone in the fluid that surrounds the baby. So testosterone is thought of as a male hormone, but actually both sexes produce it. It's just that males produce twice as much as females. And uh, we know from animal research that uh, this hormone has 
what's called organisational effects on brain development. Organisational is another word for permanent effects. Uh, so with rats, you can do experiments that would be unethical in humans. You can manipulate how much of the hormone the, the baby is exposed to by injecting more testosterone or blocking it. And uh, what's found is that the amount of testosterone a, a female rat is exposed to in the womb or at birth changes the way her brain develops. It, uh, if you increase the amount of testosterone, for example, uh, then her brain becomes more like a typical male brain. So this hormone is clearly having uh, a very important role in masculinization of the brain. So this graph isn't about rats, it's back to humans. It's showing you that we've been able to measure how much testosterone there is in the amniotic fluid where the pregnancy is a male baby in blue or a female baby in red. So males are showing more testosterone than females, but what I wanted to draw your attention to in this graph is the variability, the individual differences. You can see that in boys, so the right hand, the blue bar in the graph, there are some boys who are so low that they're in the female range in testosterone. But equally, in looking at the red group, the girls, um, there are some girls who are very high in testosterone, so they're in the same range as a typical boy. So our research question was, if you ignore the sex of the baby and just look at how much testosterone they're producing, and if you wait for the baby to be born and follow them up, is there any relationship between their prenatal testosterone levels and their later behavior? So that's what we've been doing. This is called the Cambridge Amniocentesis Study. Um, so just to remind you, the design of the study is that between about 12 and 19 weeks of pregnancy, that's when amniocentesis takes place. Um, and then after the, and that's when we measure the testosterone levels. And these are otherwise typically developing children. They're only in the study because their mothers are having amniocentesis. Uh, and we're doing this because the animal research suggests that this is exactly the time before birth when the hormone has its effect. So if we want to look at it in humans, we've got to catch them at the right time point, which is prenatal. Um, and then we wait for the baby to be born, and we've asked the mothers to come back into our lab when the baby was one year old, two years old, when they're starting school at age four, and actually we've been seeing them pretty much every year or two, and they're now uh, in their teens. So it's a longitudinal study, it's a sort of follow-up study, uh, where we know the testosterone levels before they were born, and we can look at how the baby, how the child is developing to see if there's any relationship between testosterone just in that critical period, as you can see, before birth, and how the child turns out. So here are just some results from that study. Um, <clears throat> when the children were eight years old, we asked them to take that test of empathy where they had to look at photographs of facial expressions and pick which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Um, this is a child version of the test you saw earlier, so we've adapted the language so it's appropriate for an eight-year-old. And here the correct answer is that he's interested in something um, and what you can see on the left-hand graph uh, is that there's a relationship be between the child's prenatal testosterone, their fetal testosterone, and how they're scoring on this empathy test. The line is going downwards, which means it's a negative correlation, meaning that the higher the child's prenatal testosterone, the more difficulty the child is having in reading faces some eight years later. Just to help you read these graphs, in red are girls and in blue are boys. And the red dots all seem to be bunched up on this end of the graph. And that's, as you'd expect, because girls produce less testosterone than boys. But when you look uh, either with the sexes combined or even just within one sex, you find this um, correlation, this negative correlation. On the right-hand side, we've got that test of attention I mentioned it earlier, the embedded figures test, uh, where you have to find 
the target shape, it's the little triangle, as quickly as you can in the overall design. Children with autism uh, are very good at this test. They're very quick and very accurate. Um, and if I had a pointer, I'd help you find it, those of you who can't see the solution. Um, but we gave this test to the eight-year-old children in our study. What you see now is that the line goes upwards, meaning that the higher the child's prenatal testosterone, the faster and more accurate they were at finding the target shape in the puzzle. So it's a positive correlation. So this really uh, was a bit of a surprise to us, that performance on these psychological tests might be related to hormones in the womb, particularly testosterone. Um, but, uh, and of course, the hormone doesn't explain performance completely. It's just uh, one factor that might, might be influencing um, how, how well you do on these tests. So we wanted to um, look at whether uh, prenatal testosterone was, had any link to autism. In this study, um, we couldn't look at autism itself because there were too few children. So what you see here is the graph of all the children who took part. Uh, so each dot is a child. And there were 235 children in the study. You know that autism is about 1% of the population. So it means that there might have been one or two children with autism in this sample, which is far too few to draw any conclusions about hormones and autism. So instead what we did was we looked at autistic traits, which is a concept which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it's the idea that we all have some autistic traits and people with autism just have uh, many more, so they're an extreme on, on that scale too. And you can measure autistic traits through questionnaires. So we asked the mothers who were in this uh, study to uh, fill in questionnaires about their child's autistic traits. And what we found was this positive correlation that the higher the child's prenatal testosterone, the more autistic traits the child was said to have at age four. So there's this, if you like, distant relationship that an event is happening before birth whilst the brain is developing um, in, uh, in the baby, in, uh, in the womb, but we're seeing an impact on uh, their skills, their social skills, um, their attention to detail, but also the number of autistic traits they have. Now that these children are old enough, we've actually asked them to come back for a brain scan. It would have been hard to do this when they were young because in a brain scan you have to stay still for at least half an hour. And um, those of you who are parents know that, um, that it's quite hard to ask a young child to stay still, uh, let alone in a sort of very alien environment like a brain scanner. But when they, when they were um, eight to 10 years old, we thought they could probably tolerate having a brain scan and a lot of the kids were very interested to take part. Uh, but because we knew their prenatal testosterone levels, we could then look to see where in the brain is testosterone having its effect. And this sort of study hadn't been done in humans before, although I told you that we know quite a lot about hormone effects on the rat brain. People hadn't found a way to do this in humans in an ethical way, but this seemed to be um, an ethical way to look at it. So what you can see is parts of the brain where there's a positive correlation with prenatal testosterone levels, shown in red, and a negative correlation with prenatal testosterone levels, shown in blue. I won't go through all these brain regions, but suffice it to say that this is giving us information about where in the brain testosterone is, is having an influence. So I want to sort of uh, finish in the last five minutes, then we can have a discussion telling you about this collaboration with Denmark, which I mentioned earlier, because we've been doing this study for the last five years and um, it's just finished. So I'm sort of, um, I want to tell you about the results. They're not yet published. Um, but we decided to work with colleagues in Denmark because uh, they have a brain, uh, they have uh, a biobank um, where they've been collecting amniotic fluid from pregnancies since 1980. So every time a woman has an amniocentesis, 
instead of throwing the fluid away, um, the professor there has been putting the fluid into the deep freeze, uh, thinking one day it might be useful. And so they've got over 100,000 samples of amniotic fluid in the freezer. Uh, and the reason this is particularly relevant to autism research is that the other thing Denmark has is a central psychiatric register where every time someone gets a diagnosis anywhere in the country, it gets entered on a, onto a single central register so we know who went on to develop autism. So you can guess that all we had to do in the study was to... Um, to uh, we, we know who's got autism, just to go back and look to see if their amniotic fluid was available. And on that basis, we just focused on so-called singletons, which means um, the opposite of twins, you know, where there's just one baby in the pregnancy, um, because with twins, you're never quite sure whether the amniotic fluid belongs to one twin or the other. So we're just focusing on, on babies that were not twins, so-called singletons, as a piece of jargon. Um, and, and we're just focusing on those born in the 1990s because that's when um, diagnosis became much more standardised for autism. Uh, so DSM-4 was published in 1994, uh, and ICD-10 ICD was also published around that time. So we know that diagnosis is fairly similar to what it is today. On that basis, there were almost 20,000 children we could uh, look at, and we found 128 went on to develop autism. Obviously, we could pick as many as we liked without autism, so there are over 200 here, where we've measured the hormones in the amniotic fluid of these children who went on to develop autism. So this is what we wanted to do, but we needed a much larger sample to be able to do this study. And we've, done, we've looked not just at testosterone, but we've looked at um, a number of different hormones that are in the pathway um, which uh, testosterone results from, is synthesized from. So there are four so-called sex steroid hormones. One of them is progesterone, which many of you will have heard of. Um, and this graph, which is not in your handout, but is in my PowerPoint, um, is not there because the work is not yet published, but I don't mind showing it to you, um, is showing you that in autism, all of these so-called sex steroid hormones, testosterone is just one of them, but progesterone is another one, were all elevated in children who went on to develop autism. So this is, um, I think, an important finding because these are hormones that are involved in masculinizing the brain um, and they're, ha they're being produced at very early in development, so it's prenatal. It's not a genetic factor, but it's a hormonal factor that might be linked to, to autism. And so that, that's new, new work. I was going to finish just by exploring the possible relevance of this to the whole topic of women with autism and girls with autism. Um, because I suppose the prediction from this work is that uh, females with autism might be more masculinized than females without autism. And we know that there is some evidence of this, that, uh, that if you ask women on the spectrum, when they were a child, what kinds of toys did they like to play with, they didn't typically show, they didn't show the typical female patterns of wanting to play with dolls, much more interested in so-called male uh, typical play. Um, and many females with autism also report that as a child, uh, they were tomboys, their, their, their interests were much more like a typical, uh, typical male. And as adults, there's also higher rates of bisexuality reported in, in uh, women with autism. Uh, there are some studies showing elevated testosterone in females with autism. Um, so I won't go through this list completely, but there's one, one or two things I'll pick out. But suffice it to say that all these, all these features on this slide result from higher levels of testosterone, and these are all more common in women or females on the spectrum. So one example is delayed menarche, or starting uh, puberty, so the age at which you have your first period, is slightly delayed in girls on the spectrum, only by about nine months compared to typical girls. Um, 
polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, some of you will ha have heard of, which involves irregular menstrual cycles, uh, as well as late onset of puberty, um, and cysts on the ovaries. And that's more common in women on the spectrum compared to women in the general population. Uh, so these are clues that testosterone may be uh, at slightly higher levels in people who've already got a diagnosis, whereas the Danish study was telling us about early levels, prenatal levels of testosterone. This is a, a brain scanning study which um, hasn't yet been published, but which is looking at males and females with autism compared to typical males and females in terms of brain structure and finding that uh, females on the spectrum, the way they differ to typical females is in just those parts of the brain which, are, uh, which show typical sex differences. So suggesting that um, whatever it is that gives rise to typical sex differences is also giving rise to autism in females. Because of time, I'm going to stop and draw some conclusions. So I hope what I've done in this talk is um, describe to you some of the research suggesting that there are sex differences in the mind on average when you look at the general population, although this is not a politically very correct area to investigate, um, and it's full of controversy, I think you can see um, some patterns suggesting that, on average, boys and girls do differ. Some of those differences are involved in social skills uh, and in attention to detail, uh, but we're also seeing that in autism um, uh, there may be an extreme of the typical male pattern of development. The second conclusion here is that the fetal hormones, so-called sex steroids, may play a role not just in giving rise to sex differences in brain development and, and in behaviour, but also in autism. And of course, just as a reminder, these fetal sex steroid hormones, like testosterone, don't act in isolation. They interact with genes, so hormones, for example, can turn genes on and off, um, so they can affect the way genes work. And of course, they interact with our experience postnatally. So it's a complex picture. I don't, you, don't want you to think that it's all down to hormones. It's just one part of the puzzle. Uh, and they may be giving us uh, some important clues to the causes of autism. Thank you.